I just get so we have one more minute, but yeah. Um, hey everyone, thanks for coming. Um, I hope I can entertain you a little bit, maybe get you to consider, consider some, some of my thoughts. Um, you know, first of all, I want to thank the organizers, uh, especially Radek and Dorka. And you know, it's a privilege to be back here at DEF CONF. I missed it dearly uh, during you know, COVID and uh, last year I couldn't make it, but I'm honored to be back here. And uh, man, thanks for coming to my talk. Let's see, uh, how good do I get to the next slide? Yeah, okay, maybe a quick introduction. My name is Daniel Rieck. I'm not gonna read all of that to you. Uh, for those who know me, I'm not at Red Hat anymore. <laughs> I used to work at Red Hat. Um, and yeah, you, you can get the slides and find me online. Um, I spend a lot of time in open source and my core motivation for this talk um, and yeah, for my time in free and open source software is really the um, idea of like being in control of your own technology, right? That for me is the core of why I do free software. And I always had that, but with the growing dependence on technology, that's becoming more and more important. Um, and you know, keep that in mind, like that's why I'm, I want to talk about free software, decentralization, and Web3. Um, Quick disclaimer, this doesn't represent any of my former, current, or future employers. Um, and um, this, this talk is kind of a, a result of a presentation I gave last year at FOSDEM, where I spoke about uh, cloud and open source. And I mentioned Web3, and there was a big groan going through the audience. And they're like, ah, oh, Web3, he, he mentioned Web3, now, now we're not going to listen to him anymore. So I figured out, like, I'd someone, yeah, we need to dig into that a little bit. Um, so to get a baseline, a uh, bunch of questions. Who here currently does anything with cryptocurrency, holds cryptocurrency? Oh, no. That's more than at Foster. Um, who uses open source software? All right, that was a cheap one. Um, who um, thinks that cryptocurrencies are just scam and buzzword? All right, yeah, it's balanced. Um, who has a Fediverse account? So like Mastodon or something like that? And um, who is doing anything with Web3? Uh, all right, we'll get into that. Fair, fair question, fair question. All right, so that was just to get a baseline. Um, and and who, who knows what Web3 think, uh, is and thinks it's pointless and traditional centralized architectures are better? All right. All right, so I, this is probably a bit repetitive. Um, so wh why do we do... Um, f free software, and, and what is free software? So I'll use open source, free software, free and open source software synonymously, and I know we can have a long debate over that, but I'll, I'll just take it easy on that one. So the point is it's software that you can change <coughs> and redistribute the change software. You can uh, study it, understand it, and um, it's, it's free as in freedom or in free speech. It's not about you know, no cost software, free beer software. Um, that's really important, and we're going to get into why that matters. Um, so you may get paid money for free software. That's really important, and I think a lot of people here understand that because you know, many work at Red Hat, right, or are customers of Red Hat, or want to be in that space. Um, it's important because you know, before we had free software, a code was proprietary, right, and it was the major a, a differentiator, controlling access, limiting what you can do with your technology. And I mean, that's still the case if you go into any kind of proprietary system. Um, the, the rules around the software and the access you have to the software control what you can do with things. Um, there's a great book, which now I think is probably 25 years old or something, by Lawrence Lessig called Code, where he makes the, the, you know, the, the core observation that um, in a world, in, in, so this, 
It wasn't that bad that, but you can see how he was right now. In a world that is more computerized, more digitalized, and more controlled by software, the rules of software become law, right? And more than traditional laws, like if, if, if you have a legal system, you have laws, you have the ability to violate those, those laws. Right? That has consequences, but sometimes that's justified. Right? That's what you call civil disobedience. Right? When you violate a law to make a point or you know, because you think it's an unjust law, you deal with the consequences. If we go into code and the code is proprietary, the code not only becomes the law of the digital domain, but it also becomes the limit of anything you can do, because you cannot break out of the possibilities given to you by code if you cannot change the code. Right? So it's really important to understand that if, you know, and I'll, I'll revisit that, that theme a bit more, with the world becoming more digitalized and software, you know, we, we say software aids the world, right? Everything we do is software controlled. I mean, I have light switches in my house that are software controlled. I have a mousetrap that is uh, you know, connected and like, talks to me when it does its thing. You know, um, I call it edge, although like, uh, you know, it doesn't use an edge, it uses electricity. But anyhow, I don't to dwell on that um, one. But like, the point is like, e everything is software, and, um, and so it becomes really important when many things you do uh, to be aware of the fact that proprietary code limits what you can do. And it's more than just law, it becomes really the space of possibility. Um, and so, you know, if, if you look at like pre free software, you know, that also means it's a limit to, um, uh, a, a limit to, to innovation, right? It limits progress. Um, it's incentivized actually to limit progress because if you have a proprietary software um, and you control a market, you don't want to be uh, disrupted. And you, you, you know, so, so you will try to prevent change. And you get into things like software patents, which are attempts to expand control from just uh, the code, which is copyright, to even uh, control of ideas. Um, and it, you know, it creates, uh, so the goal becomes automatically to create a lock-in and create de dependencies there. Right? Um, and free software, in contrast, democratized access to technology, enabled superior, uh, superior collaboration model. And that's kind of a lot of what we see why, I mean, we sometimes say free software has won, right? Because basically everything you do today with technology, even if it's proprietary, is based on free software, right? Free software is the base for every service you use that's a managed service. And it creates like an interesting situation. So it democratized access to technology. Um, it has a collaboration model that allows even competitors to co-develop and co-invent while then competing on, le on higher levels or you know, additional services. Um, and it created the ability to have digital sovereignty, right? Like, so, um, I mean, that's in, in, when, when I was still in, in Germany, um, you know, a big problem was that basically uh, every technology, uh, everything in software was controlled by uh, proprietor companies that were outside of Germany, right? And so you really, as a, even as a country, you didn't, you, you had a full dependency. I mean, that's probably still the case. I don't spend much time there anymore. But, um, and that trick is down to the individual, right? Again, if you are um, if you are confined by proprietary code, you cannot control what you do, right? So this is, this is the problem, and open source or free software solved that. Um, and that is, you know, again, that's my personal motivation. I think it's probably the motivation for a lot of us why we want to do free software. Um, but we see some existential threats to free software now. And from my point of view, it's cloud, for one, because it's built on free software. It often, you know, even the code is free, but the oper oper <laughs> operating it, <laughs> Operating it has become a new proprietary differentiator. So you have open source software and you, you get everything, but you can't actually run it, or at least not securely and reliably. Right? So you create, suddenly we have dependencies 
um, on how to run the software at scale and like even the knowledge gap or you can't like a lot of smaller companies just run into the problem that they can't even hire people who can run the software even if they want to because you know they all work for the cloud providers. Um, I'm not going to go too deep into that. Um, the, the, the second problem I see is the convenience and network effect of centralization. Right? Um, it's, that amplifies kind of the problem of, of cloud um, when it becomes so much easier to use a proprietary service right, that has um, a monetary uh, that has monetarization um, and um, that has nice usability, that has a lot of content, and that creates kind of a gravity pulling people in. That uh, means that you're pulled into the walled garden of the higher level proprietary service, even if that's based on open source software. The next problem is a growing, uh, growing desire for regulatory intervention, and I'll talk a bit more about that. And then as a result of both of them, we see a certain level of neglect and decay in open source projects. Right? They don't get the same level of attention anymore. Um, and, and some of that kind of, you know, it, it's like I, uh, I'm presenting with LibreOffice, um, but LibreOffice is a little bit in trouble because everyone is using uh, you know, online uh, Google Docs. My, myself, too, because if you want to collaborate, that's much, e much easier there. Now, there are alternatives, again, uh, like the open, open, uh, LibreOffice has a server model, and it's pretty easy with Nextcloud to run it yourself, but that is an additional step, right? And already have Google anyways, because you know, no one can run their own email anymore, because it's too hard to securely operate that. And even if you know how to securely, which I gave up some years ago, because it's just keeping that secure, keeping the hacker sense of spam out is too hard. And then even if you run it, Google will not accept your mail anymore. Right, because of their anti-spam policies, right? So, they, so, so it's all open source. Everything Google does there is using open source. It's open standards, and still you can't use it, right? So it exemplifies the problem I'm trying to, to explain here that, that exists there. Um, so I want to focus a little bit on the convenience of the network effect of centralization and regulatory uh, interventions. So centralization you know, is, is a real problem. And you see that um, in you, you know, big examples of social media, obviously, and, um, and uh, you know, my favorite in, in free software, my favorite example is GitHub. Um, I mean, like, and, and I don't even want to go into like the problem of an ad-based business model in social media, and that like that's a whole, that's probably like a day's debate. Um, but you know, the the um, the thing is, it's really hard to figure out how to get paid for free software decentralized models. Right? That's a big debate. I know, for example, in Red Hat and, and the open source community, there's some conflicts around that. Um, this is much easier, again, with a centralized service. Right? And um, then, you know, if you have that, it's even you know, people who, who will criticize a decentralized monetization are totally happy with monetization in a centralized service, which makes, so it's psychological, but it, like if you dig deeper, it makes no sense because it's measuring these two different models. So that's an advantage for the centralized services. You know, then they get the critical mass, they're more convenient, and you end up in a situation right, where um, the, majori the majority of the important or popular free software projects are now fully dependent on a proprietary platform run by a company that historically, and I believe still at their core, thinks that free software is a cancer. And that was a quote from their former CEO. That is not a healthy situation. Right? Um, in social media, I mean, so, so the, the situation with, with yeah, I'm picking on GitHub a little bit. Right? Um, and, uh, I was in Brussels and they gave a speech on open source. It was really, it really pissed me off because it was really disingenuous. Because, you know, I visited, like, when are they open sourcing GitHub, right? I mean, and it's really interesting because Git itself is deliberately written as a decentralized solution. 
for collaboration that's decentralized. But the convenience of having everything in one place, cross-references, issue management, you know, that pulled everyone into GitHub, which is really, really convenient. Yeah. GitLab is there as an alternative, but no one uses GitLab. I run my own instance of GitLab, but what is the percentage of projects that are in GitLab? And GitLab itself is still a centralized solution. Right? With a whole bunch, like, I mean, sure, it could be worse, right? But GitLab has an open core model, right? Um, it tries to just be the alternative to GitHub. And it carries, it lessens the impact, but it carries all the same challenges. Um, and in social media, I mean, we had, there was a big move away from Twitter, right? For various reasons, and it's just an observation. A lot of people moved to Mastodon that is not sustained, right? The content is not on Mastodon. A lot of people moved to Blue Sky, which basically is just Twitter with different politics, right? Um, so now you have the choice between, for, to actually get content, you can go to Twitter and you get like one side of craziness and censorship, or you go to Blue, Sky, Blue Sky, you get the other side of craziness and censorship, but you are not able to control yourself what you see, right? A good decentralized solution would put you in control of what you see, not a centralized platform that with their code decides what you can do, right? Uh, that, but, but, but there you get into decay. Because even the Red Hat projects are not using Pagur, but um, you know, Center Stream uses GitLab. Which, uh, given the alternatives, is the lesser evil. But they're not using Pagur, even though that would be a different approach. Right? And now we get to censorship, and I, you know, with social media, we get in there, right? We get suddenly a centralized control. And um, you know, with software eating the world, that's become, going to become more and more of a topic. Historically, it's content, right? Who can say what and who defines what truth is and whatever. Um, with very different views, depending where you are. I mean, someone, some people have heard about a place called China, um, where uh, you know, certain things are true and other things are untrue. And then in Europe, depending where you are, certain things are true, other things are untrue. In the US, it depends in which, well, actually, it depends in which city you are. <laughs> to some degree, right? And then what the, so you have this network effect. Um, and that creates a lot of desire for different groups to control things. Um, that gets worse with AI, uh, or well, I, I'm biased there, I'll, I'll, I'll admit that, right? What I call AI doomerism, right? People think that text completion models will like turn all of us into paper clips. Um, where now, um, you know, there, there are, there's regulation in the EU, there is an executive order in the US, there's now California is trying to do their own rules. They are the worst ones so far, basically limiting what you can do with math, right? Which is crazy, right? Because some people watched some science fiction movies and some other people really have an interest in establishing a proprietary control model. Now, in my view is that most of what you see in AI regulation is actually about a regulatory capture of a market by the people who are ahead, but they know that they're ahead by that little because it's so early, and they want to use the government in the same way they use software patents to prevent um, alternatives and competition. Um, they're going to try to use AI regulation to prevent others from entering the market. Um, and then, you know, centralized platforms became the premier target for these kind of things, right? And you already have seen, I mean, this is a big problem 
in social media, but it has started to leach into software. It has started to leach into free software. I mean, someone like a niche problem there is people who now want kind of controlled use licenses, right? They, like that, that was a big thing where people started, oh yeah, we want to put in a license that you cannot use it for bad things, right? Which is, of course, not free software anymore if you do that. If you regulate what people can do with software, it's violation of the definition of free software. Um, and it, n it never will end well, right? <laughs> like there's no way that it will end well. But, but the next round of attempts, so that failed, but these things always come back. And the next round is that they're trying to get, for example, GitHub to um, block certain projects or certain people that they don't agree with. Right? And you see, that, you see that from governments and you see that from interest groups. And um, a lot of that is going to come also out of a security mindset, right? Um, I mean, in, in, in Europe, um, there, there's a very realistic chance now that you'll end up with um, chat control. Right, so uh, government mandated backdoors that invalidate end-to-end -end encryption for your chat. Uh, the, U, the people in, in the U.S. They, they, they tried that and tried that and tried that. They tried that in the U.S. It failed, and now they're doing the next round. And they're probably they're using, of course, child. You know, it's all for the kids, right? It's uh, child protection as the justification. It's pointless because it's not going to change anything. But then they're going to expand it and use it to control what what you say and automatically report things. Um, and uh, it's a realistic chance that you will end up with that in Europe um, within the next 12 months. Um, again, that targets centralized platforms. That's the only way this can be enforced. So what is going to happen in the current approach, if I understand it right, they're not trying to do a backdoor in the, uh, in the chat service anymore, because with end-to-end -end encryption, it doesn't work. And it, like, the attempt to force them to put in backdoors didn't work. So now they're going to do what Apple already tried in the US, which is they put a scanner on your phone. And only the apps that have the scanner enabled are allowed in the App Store, because that they can regulate. Right? With a centralized app store, you're going to be limited to software that will scan everything you say before it gets encrypted. And that's obviously a problem if you care about privacy. Um, so these things, um, these things are am amplifying you know, the problems of centralized platforms. Right? And um, in centralized platforms, you have no way out of this. Decentralization is the only way to get around that. Right? If there's no central app store, then they cannot limit what software you can get. If, you know, there is, if, if you install your own operating system on your phone, they cannot regulate as well. Or they would have to get very heavy handed going after individuals. Right? which is much, much harder than going after a centralized platform and often will run into actual civil liberties protections. Right? In the US, for example, in the current interpretation of the Constitution, you cannot do it. Right? They will not be able to do it. In Europe, probably they will not be able to sustain it. I mean, I'm not a <coughs> constitutional expert, I'm not a, a lawyer, but. I have high hopes that individual protections still work. Well, centralized companies have basically no protections. Um, so that's why you know, one reason, if you care about privacy, if you care about individual liberty, then decentralization is the only way you can do it. But the same actually applies for companies that want to freely innovate, right? Um, because centralized platforms will create walled gardens. And we have been there, right? We have had this. And free software liberated us from it. So centralization recreates it on a new level. The combination of cloud and the convenience of these hosted services will create new rules that limit what you can do as a company. You know? The counter movements um, are the Fediverse, cryptocurrencies, and Web3. And um, you know, I, I ask kind of the leading question, who thinks that cryptocurrencies are really a scam? Right? Which is how they are coded, right? Like, it, it, depending where you are. I mean, it, it's really interesting. 
Um, the, I think it changed a little bit since last year. So at my, at my first talk, it was really like, oh, Web3 and cryptocurrencies. If you mention that, we're not going to take you serious anymore. Interestingly, in the US, it completely changed because suddenly, like, I mean, if you have a Fidelity retirement account, you get advertisements from your, the people you trust with your retirement account, Fidelity, that they want you to open a crypto account with them, right? So, like, there, there is this adoption of crypto by trusted entities and uh, some regulation around it, right? You have regulated exchanges now. Um, at the same time, you have a huge adoption in kind of the uh, emerging markets, non in traditional non-industrialized countries in a grassroots fashion. So um, in the US, a lot of, you know, traditionally, a lot of people come to the US to work there as immigrants and send money home. And that historically was a very uh, lossy transfer because you know banks, if possible, are you know controlled by corrupt entities, do a lot of value extraction. You know it's hard to send money you know back to Guatemala in a bank transfer, right? Um, and, and Guatemala is probably one of the easy ones. What people did then is, is kind of these networks where you go to an internet cafe, you pay someone, and then they call someone and they pay something out. But you can imagine like how well that works. Or they do money orders, which has even more fraud than cryptocurrencies and scam, right? And now they're using cryptocurrencies, and they're like abstraction around that that are really useful. And this has changed people's life, like creating more secure transfer for people who otherwise were limited by the system. So, and you see the same in Asia. You see the same in Africa. So you have a huge grassroots movement of adoption of cryptocurrencies as a, as a solid, reliable transfer that is protected from predatory governments, predatory companies, and reduces the fraud abuse because it takes intermediaries out of the system. Um, so uh, this is something like that you won't see necessarily in the mainstream media here, or like it's not something you see in the Western countries because you don't have that problem. You know? But it starts when you try to, I, so I work for a startup in Switzerland, um, and uh, you know, it, I get my money if I transfer it as stable coin to my regulated US account. I get it immediately with like almost no fees versus I wait a week um, and pay you know, kind of 3% fees when I do it through traditional banks. And I, I did that before I worked for a Swiss company and had a bank account in Switzerland, a bank account in the US, and then had to do like transfers through an, um, uh, uh, like a, a, a currency exchange and whatever. And then uh, the Swiss bank didn't want to deal with US regulation anymore and closed my account and, and like shit like that, right? Um, that all goes away with this decentralized finance. Um, of course, um, what about FTX and Sam Bankman, Sam Bankman Fried and the big scam, right? The interesting thing there is that really was just traditional finance fraud. It has nothing to do with crypto, right? If you go in, it, it's just basically what Madoff did before, um, if you followed that. Um, so going to Web3, and I'm running out of time, so I have to speed up a little bit. Um, so it's not the only way to do decentralization, right? There's a Fediverse. Um, there are other ways you can just do decentralized systems, but all of them run into the problem of um, trust and monetization um, and permission models, right? Which is what, what the centralized systems can do really well, and decentralized systems are really bad at. And you, you have like overlays. I mean, Red Hat, for, in one way, is an overlay to decentralized software development, right? A Linux distribution takes decentralized software development, puts it in a consumer product that you can charge in a format that you can charge a company for something and gives them trust. That's the core of the Red Hat's business model, at least in the, in the RHEL space. That's really useful, but that doesn't necessarily scale to consumer markets. It doesn't scale to other things. It's, you know, it, it's challenging it in itself. Web3, the difference between Web3 and other um, uh, decentralization approaches is that Web3 is designed to address directly these problems. Right? So it has... its it's inherently open source. It's inherently it's designed to be decentralized. It's designed to be permissionless. It means like you don't have a central permission control. 
you have um, zero trust, so you don't have to trust an intermediary right? because you have cryptographic validation and your local control. Um, it's not the same as cryptocurrencies. You can use a technology without, but with cryptocurrency, you have the implicit monetization capabilities. Um, and you see right now a similar adoption model as in cryptocurrencies for Web3 technology in emerging markets, um, which, which it's, it's interesting. It's sometimes it has a little bit an absurd effect with, because now there are major cloud providers in Asia um, with Web3 biz dev teams, which it kind of you know, contradicts. Um, so, Nick, where, do I, where am I going with this, right? So my main point is, right, the future of free software and to some degree civil liberties depends on decentralization, right? If everything is centralized, we are back to the proprietary world. The cloud is basically the mainframe reinvented, running proprietary service using black box software on someone else's hardware. Um, We need to be deliberate about our decentralization, right? We have to overcome the convenience of centralization and go out. And we need to look at technologies at the merit of technology and not the labels given, you know, or potential abuses. And we have to really go into Web3 as the thing that makes this possible in a better way than any other model from my point of view. Examples is Radical is a, a Web3 GitHub alternative that's evolving. And um, uh, you know, IPS Filecoin, IPFS Filecoin is more established, but it's uh, cloud-based storage. And IPFS, for example, uh, 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 some of the like, big uh, CDNs use IPFS, so the technology is pretty solid, right? That's proven. Um, and then Status Vaku, um, Vashek, who gave a talk yesterday, talked about that is here. Um, that's, uh, so Status is kind of a chat collab platform that's really interesting. And soon a new version is coming out that um, I recommend people look at. Uh, and Vacu is a, is a broader set of uh, technologies around um, Web3. I recommend looking at these things. And these slides will be available so you can find more. All right. Thank you very much. Any uh, questions, discussion? About? I don't know the acronym. Which has the cryptocurrency regulation in Europe, uh, like oh, okay. regulating how much we can transfer. It needs to have KYC for uh, okay. Yeah, so I don't, I'm not familiar with it because I'm not spending much time in, in Europe, but um, I mean, I'm skeptical. We have, so w in, in the US, there was, there's an attempt to create like a, um, a central bank cryptocurrency with some of the arguments, oh, we can filter out scams then. Um, a centralized cryptocurrency with a government filter on what transactions are acceptable it's the worst form of centralization, in my view, right? I mean, the entity most likely to really abuse your civil rights is always the government. That's why we have constitutions that limit the government. That, and you can go through all of European history, all of, yeah, I mean, the US is kind of the whole point of stopping that. That's why the US we cre fought for independence from, from Great Britain, or whatever that was called back then. Um, and I, yeah, so I, I think that is the, the wrong answer, centralized filter, centralized scam protection, because it, it, it will be used not to protect you from scam, but it, like I've, we've seen that in Canada when these trucker protests happened, right? So uh, some truckers were against the COVID regulation and blocked streets, right? Drove their trucks to uh, the capital and blocked the streets, and then their bank accounts were canceled, and cryptocurrency transfers were blocked.
right? So there you see what's going to happen. It had nothing to do with scams. It was all for political control. Well, the same kind of protest tactics are accepted by the same government if they agree with the policy. And I, I, I wasn't specific, like, I'm not supporting what these truckers, and I'm not even a fan of these tactics of blocking streets. I actually think that's terrible. But you, you, in Canada, you have the explicit situation where the government punishes certain people using these kind of centralized technologies while letting other people do the same things because they agree with them politically. And that's, I think that's where, for me, all these regulations end. Like they, they will all end up in the same spot. On? Solid. Uh, well intended, but I, I don't know if it has the traction. Yeah. In the research area. Mm. I mean, I think solid. So, Tim Lern, uh, Tim, uh, so the guy who invented the World Wide Web. Um, I mean, like his. I will see. I mean, it's good to try. I, I think anything. All right, I'm really out of time. I mean, yeah. So the <laughs> you were you had your hand up earlier. So. So the, the so yes and yes, <laughs> but it depends. I, I'll be, yeah, we, we, so I'll be outside, but I think, so they, it's going to be a fight, right? It's not easy. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs>